Hey, Pastor Rob here. Just wanted to thank you for checking out our messages online and wanted to encourage you. I pray that your soul is nourished through the hearing of the word. But at the same time, the writer of Hebrews is very clear about uh, not giving up meeting together. Don't give up the larger gathering. As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, the early church made it a point to meet together almost daily even, breaking bread together, encouraging one another, being in communion with one another to build each other up. And, and that is vitally important to your spiritual walk. So I pray that you enjoy this message, but at the same time, I pray that you find a great church body to be a part of, whether that be here at the bridge or somewhere else, so that you can be built up as well. Thank you and God bless. You could tell the cheese factor's on point because every joke is not landing well at all. Like <laughs> every joke that we're putting up, we're like, oh, it's like that painful dad joke, you know, feeling that's going on, right? So, hey guys, uh, so glad you're with us today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Rob Williams and I am the lead pastor here at the bridge. And man, um, I'm so glad that you were able to make it today. I'm loving seeing all the Hawaiian shirts. Looking pretty good today, guys. Way to go. Way to show up. We've even got uh, our college team from Oklahoma Wesleyan. Can you guys stand for a minute? Can we give them a hand this morning? Uh, a few of them wore Hawaiian shirts, so that's awesome. Uh, Oklahoma Wesleyan, guys, they're a, a college team that's uh, from Oklahoma. They, they came and they've been helping out at our camp and ministering at our camp this week and investing in our kids and my kids. And man, uh, I think it's awesome that my son is sitting next to one of them, which just shows that they're doing their job well. Uh, uh, guys, be praying for our camp this week. As, uh, before we jump into the message, I want to kind of give you an update on a few things. Um, uh, number one, uh, continue to be praying for Cedar Springs Camp, okay, guys? Josh, you might have to help me out, man. My clicker's being stupid. Um, uh, Cedar Springs Camp, guys, be, be continuing to pray for them. It sounds like the first week of camp went great. As a matter of fact, eight kids gave their lives to Christ this week, which we're super excited about that. Um, I kind of had a proud dad moment myself. My son recommitted his life to Christ, and I'm really, really excited to see what God's doing in his life. It's just been really uh, fun to just watch. And um, guys, this week they've got, so last week was middle school camp. This week they've got high school camp. And uh, I think Isaac and Sarah are headed out there with a few other of our youth leaders. And so be in prayer for them uh, and for that whole team. They're going to have a blast. My wife came back home tired but excited about next week. And so um, just keep them in your prayers, all right? A couple of updates I want to give you as well. Um, last week I talked about a little sweet girl named Ava Kane who was in the hospital. Um, as a matter of fact, she had been attacked by a dog a week ago last Friday. And um, uh, I'm happy to report, last time we talked, she was under heavy sedation in the PICU at Mayo Clinic, and today she's at home. Uh, so can we praise God for that? That's so awesome. Um, super, super thankful. So thank you. Uh, her mom, Sam, wanted to say thank you for all the prayers and everything that you guys have done to just support them. Uh, they're hoping to be back in church, I think, sometime next week. I think they're watching online today. So, uh, But Ava's doing great. She's talking. She's eating. She's awake. Things are going really, really well. And obviously, they sent her home. Uh, everything went in the right direction very quickly. And so uh, I don't think that's anything short of a miracle from Jesus. So thank you for your prayers. Um, lastly, guys, if you, don't, if, you, if, you don't, if you weren't here with us last week, I also talked about a little boy named Jax Shaw. Jax uh, was diagnosed with leukemia um, uh, just a couple of months ago, and Becky and Casey are a part of our church family. Their whole family is a part of our church family, and um, they just adopted Jax this last year, and then he got diagnosed with leukemia, and he's got a long road ahead of him. Um, the good news is, is that the, the leukemia has a really high survival rate. However, the bad news is he's got a long road ahead of him of chemo treatments and things like that. Um, and they just came out, or they should be coming out of right now pretty soon, one of the toughest phases. And so they could use your prayers and your support. But also, you might remember last week uh, me talking about a gift card drive that we're going to be doing for Jax and the whole family. Um, I talked to Casey, his dad, of whom you can see in the photo there. Um, uh, they're doing great financially as far as insurance and everything. It's going to be covered, all the bills and everything like that. Praise God for that. Really, really good. However, obviously, this is going to take a lot of time out of their calendars to have to go back and forth to Iowa City. It's going to be a long road ahead of them of treatments and different things like that. And, uh, man, they could use your prayers in a big way. But then also, something that we came up with a, as an idea was that we as a church would just do as much as we can to just shower them with gift cards, okay? So whether it's gift cards for gas or gift cards for a 
fast food restaurant or something like that. Um, the, the goal is to just like take that burden off of them while they're going back and forth to Iowa City. And so if you haven't heard yet, man, uh, this next a week or so, if you're able, while you're at the grocery store, you know that big rack full of gift cards that you see at Hy-Vee and places like that? Um, man, just grab one of those that you think might be good. Maybe Google what restaurants there are in Iowa City um, or on the route to Iowa City from Osage. That's where Casey and Becky are from. They're from Iowa City. Or they're, excuse me, they're from Osage. Um, uh, and pick out a gift card that you think would, would suit them well and do, do, do good for them, and that'll kind of help support them and, and help them get through this next um, uh, season of their lives, okay? Um, from what I understand, I've been talking to Casey. Jax is doing great. Um, uh, he did have kind of a scare about a, a couple weeks ago where he spiked a fever, and they had to take him down to Iowa City. He was uh, um, uh, brought in for, I think, a few days. They checked him in for a few days, but he's come out of that from what I understand, and they're just kind of pushing along. So continued prayers are always appreciated. Okay? All right, guys, let's get in the Word, shall we? We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5 this morning. Ephesians 5, if you have your Bibles with you. Um, I want you to go ahead and turn there now. Um, if you're joining us online, man, we're so glad you're with us. However, church is not just about getting fed or attending a service. It's about building community and meeting new people and, and, and getting a church family to, to build relationships and come around you. So if you are uh, joining us online, man, we're glad you're with us, but we hope we get to see you in person at some point or another. Or better yet, if you're not in the area, maybe you can find an awesome, healthy local church around you so that you can build real church, church community. But if you're joining us online, um, you don't have a Bible at home, you can use Y-O-U version. It's Y-O-U version. It's a great way to read scripture and share it with others. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5, guys. But um, before we jump in, can we just pray? Can we just pray for the Lord's favor over today? Um, Lord, I just love you, and I thank you. <clears throat> thank you for the times that you work in me despite me. Lord, I thank you for the days where um, I fall short and you are made strong, um, where in my weakness you are seen as so much greater than I could ever be, Lord. And I, and I just thank you for this church family and for a full house and second service and God, just for the energy in the room and God, for what I know you want to do in these next few minutes. Um, Lord, help us, help us to ingest the, the word that we're about to read. Help us to not just hear your word, but to take action because of what we learn from it. And God, may you bless our families and our communities and our nation thereafter as we try, as we attempt to be more like your son Jesus each and every single day. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said... Amen. All right, guys. Well, today, um, I, I know that we've uh, been in a series called Grow Up, and man, I know a lot of us have been loving that series. I know that, that God's been using that series to work in me quite a bit. But today, guys, um, I've felt led for a few months now to preach a Father's Day message. I don't normally do this. This is actually kind of out of sync from what I normally do. Typically, um, I'm not the holiday pastor that preaches like Christmas series or preaches Mother's Day messages or Father's Day messages. But back in about March or April, I kind of felt like God was just laying a burden on my heart to preach a Father's Day message. I don't know why as I was doing my sermon planning. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the same year that I decided to preach a Father's Day message, uh, I don't know if you guys were here in May, but Eric actually preached a Mother's Day message. And I just think it's, it's just so cool that, that God just kind of works these things out and puts them together. Um, and, and as I think about Father's Day, guys, today what I want to speak to you about is just biblical fatherhood. So if you're a note taker, that's the title of today's message. It's called Biblical uh, Fatherhood. Um, uh, but as I, as I think about fathers, as I think about Father's Day, I, I consider myself extremely lucky and blessed. And the reason I say that is because I don't just have one good dad in my life, but I have two. Um, I have an amazing father that was present in my life and, and did everything he could to raise me to be the man that I am today. But then I also um, have a father-in-law who is doing much the same in the sense that he is following Jesus, doing everything he can to live an honorable life and to honor God with everything that he's doing. Now, um, uh, I realize that because I have not just one dad, but two dads that are present and available in my life, I actually am a very lucky person. Because I know that there are a lot of you in the room today that may or may not have their father present in their lives. Um, and if he is, he may not necessarily be a great influence in your life. 
And, and, and what might encourage you is, is this. My dad was not always that type of guy. As a matter of fact, when I was younger, both of my fathers, when both my wife and I were younger, both of our fathers weren't exactly following Jesus. So Stefan, okay, who my wife is named after, my father-in-law, okay, Stefan, he was actually a military guy. And he uh, spent 20 years in the military, and during that time in the military, he was a partier and a drinker, and he would admit this to you himself. My wife tells me all kinds of crazy stories, and he has told me all kinds of crazy stories about the days that he was a father in the military. And, and due to the nature of his job, as well as the kind of person that he was, he really wasn't um, as present as he would have liked to be as a father um, when he was younger. And then my father, Robert Taylor Williams Jr., okay, because I am actually the third, Robert Taylor Williams Jr. owned his own businesses, and my dad worked extremely hard. As a matter of fact, he owned a pizza company called Home Team Pizza, and there were a lot of weeks where I would not see my dad at all. Um, as a matter of fact, when he was running that business, he owned nine different stores with another uh, partner of his, and uh, there were some weeks where my dad would work 100-hour weeks. Him and, my, him and I were talking uh, last year, and, and we were talking about the, the kind of hours he's worked his entire life. And he said, Rob, I don't think I've ever had a job where I've worked less than 60 hours a week. And, and when I was younger, as, as present as my dad tried to be, he really couldn't be as present as he would have liked to be. And not only that, he wasn't following Jesus himself. And yet, and yet they, would both, uh, they, they would both probably uh, say that they at least had a small bit of faith and attempted to lead their households with honor at the forefront. And, and what's ironic was, was as much as they would say that they probably didn't have a relationship with Jesus and weren't really following him, their biggest influence in leading an honorable household was God himself from what they learned as children themselves. So if you think that the children's department and the nursery department and the bridge church isn't important, you could not be more wrong. Raising your children in the church and impressing God on their hearts matters because the Bible says when they are older, they will turn back to him. They will return to the ways that they know. You see, my father and my father-in-law weren't exactly Jesus followers when we were younger as kids, but as my wife and I grew older into our teen years, something changed in both of our dads that I think still to this day has impacted our lives greatly. Despite the trials and tribulations that both our fathers have been through, once they got, got serious about their faith in Jesus, they did their best to become fathers that were present, loving, kind, honorable, and gentle, but firm when they needed to be. My wife and I can both testify to the impactful presence of our fathers in our lives. As a matter of fact, we will probably say we have a stronger relationship with our dad than our mom in, in a lot of cases. We can testify to them leading us. Excuse me. We can testify to them being involved and present in the church. We can testify to them leading us into the sanctuary and leading by example in their, uh, in their faith at home. They did everything they could to honor our mothers well. And to love our mothers first, even before us. And, and they set the example of honor, hard work, and honesty in everything they ever did. As a matter of fact, many of the teachings that I'm passing on to my kids today, sometimes I kind of cringe at because I'm like, man, dad was right, right? Like, these are some of the teachings or a lot of the teachings that my dad taught me when I was younger. My father, in particular, had a massive impact on my life. And I count that a privilege because I understand that there are a lot of people in the room this morning that probably don't get to say that. As a matter of fact, data from the United States Census Bureau shows that nearly 18 million children in America grow up without their fathers. 18 million kids in America grow up without their fathers, which has in return, maybe you didn't know this, led the United States to owning the title of the world's leader in fatherlessness. The United States of America has more absent fathers than any other country across the globe. For some reason or another, here in America, fathers are becoming more and more absent in the home. And it's tragic. I, I don't know about you, but I just think about that and my stomach just sinks. My heart just sinks. For obvious reasons. Fathers are essential to the health, success, and wellness of our homes. Fathers are vital. Everybody say vital. 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 Fathers are vital pieces of the family unit that cannot be replaced. And I like using the word vital because vital means necessary to the existence of. 
Vital means uh, necessary to the continuance or well-being of something. Vital means indispensable. When you have a vital organ go down in your body, the chances of survival become extremely low, right? Fathers are vital pieces of the family unit. As a matter of fact, according to uh, fathersplace.org, we know these things. We know that research shows that when fathers are involved, their children are two, more li- times, two times more likely to go to college. They're 80% less likely to spend time in jail, and they're 75% less likely to experience teen pregnancy. And when a dad isn't there, it's a completely different picture because when a dad, when a child comes from a father absent home, they are 70, 71% of all high school dropouts come from a father absent home. Did you know that? 90% of homelessness and runaway children come from a father absent home. And not only that, but 63% of teen suicides come from homes where the father was not there. It's sobering statistics, isn't it? It's just like we talked about last week when I was talking about healthy community and being a part of the body. Each and every one of us are essential pieces of the body of Christ. And in the same way, men, fathers are essential, vital pieces of the family unit. And this doesn't really surprise me because when you read Scripture, it doesn't take long to see the essential nature of the presence of the Father in our lives. You don't even have to go any further than Genesis chapter 2 and 3. This last week, I was, I, I, we just started a men's group at my house and uh, that we meet on Tuesday mornings and we're going through this book called Dad Tired. And in the first chapter, um, the, the, the author is talking about what's normal for, to God versus what's normal in the world that we're living in today. And, and he references Genesis chapter 2. And if, I don't know if you've ever read Genesis chapter 2, but I like to think of Genesis chapter 2 as the blueprint for all of creation, right? When you read Genesis chapter 2, you see God's original intentions for mankind, that they might be fruitful and multiply, that they might live in community together, that they might be in harmony with not only with one another, but with God, that they might work the garden, that they might be, um, uh, 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 how do I say this, um, that they might be a plus to society in every way, shape, and form, not just relationally, but practically. Like there's this beautiful picture of how humankind is supposed to operate, and one of the unique um, factors that we see in Genesis chapter 1 through 3 is this, that the humankind is walking with the heavenly Father himself. Think about it. Have you ever read Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve eat of the fruit? When Adam and Eve eat of the fruit... Thereafter, God comes looking for them. And I love how the Bible describes it. The Bible says that God was walking through the garden. It's almost as if there was this human-like presence that represented God that was walking alongside mankind. And that was normal. But after the fall... We don't see anything like that again until we see Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He came to fulfill the prophecies and to bring back what was supposed to be normal, to restore humanity to its full extent, to restore humanity to a Genesis chapter 2 kind of thing, that he might bring heaven to earth, right? So, so what does that mean? That means that normal is having the Father present in our lives, while abnormal is not having a father present. And here's the thing. I'm not stupid. I know that while the statistics say that the father was physically absent, 18 million fathers are physically absent, we have a lot more dads that are completely absent. Amen? Like, it's not just physical. They might be there physically, but they're emotionally absent, or they're spiritually absent, or they're not actually engaged in their kids' lives, or worse yet, they're not engaged in their marriages. Which are the examples of their kids? We're going to talk about that in a minute. Normal, though, the way God has always intended it would be that we might walk with our fathers and our fathers might walk with us just like we walked with our Heavenly Father and our Heavenly Father walked with us. You see, you can take this statement however you want. You can take it as your life with your Heavenly Father. You can take it as your life with your paternal Father here on earth. Whether you believe in God or not, I don't think there's anyone in this room this morning that thinks an absent Father is a good thing. 
Nobody thinks a fatherless home is a good thing. Not having the presence of our father in the home is not okay. And some of you have some baggage that you carry because, man, dad wasn't there. And you need to know that you have a heavenly father who loves you despite the fact that your earthly father did not do well in that. You need to know that your heavenly father wants to be present in your life and he wants to walk alongside you despite the fact that your earthly father didn't make that a priority. He understands the pain that comes with not having the father at his side. And he understands that it's not okay. That's not the ideal for anyone, let alone Christians who believe in the importance of a traditional home. And if you believe, if you believe in Jesus and if you believe in God, the importance of having your heavenly father walk alongside you in this life is paramount. But, but, but here's the thing. Biblical fatherhood is about so much more than just being present. Okay, and that's what I want to dig into today. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5, okay? Um, and what I want to do is that we're going to actually read through the whole chapter. We're going to start at the very beginning. Um, and, and many people, as they read through this chapter, especially the latter half of chapter 5, we, we think of this as the marriage chapter, right? Because the latter half of chapter, Ephesians chapter 5 is, is all about, you know, wives submit to your husbands, and husbands give yourself up for your wives as your wife, give, you know, as Christ did the church. And when we read that, we're like, okay, this is the marriage chapter. But if you actually read throughout this passage, you realize that, man, a lot of the things that are said by the Apostle Paul here are actually geared towards the men. And I just want you to notice that. Even the marriage passage, when you look at the marriage passage, it talks to the women for like three sentences, and then it spends like the next nine sentences talking about the men. I mean, a lot of this passage is actually geared towards men, and I actually think it gives us the framework for what a biblical father looks like. So I, this is a very simple message, but I think it's vitally important. So let's just work through this together, okay? We're going to start in Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 1, okay? This is what it says. Imitate God. Everybody say, imitate God. That's job number one, therefore, in everything you do. Because you are his dear children. Live a life that is filled with love. Following the example of Christ, he loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of God, of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins. For the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. Don't participate in the things these people do. For once you were full of darkness, but now you, are full of li- uh, you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It's shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret, but their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them, for the light makes everything visible. That's why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. So be careful how you live, he says. Don't live like fools. Like what? Fools. But those who are wise... Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so let's stop there for a minute. Right away, we see point number one, and it's going to seem super simple and super cheesy and super Christian and super basic, but I'm telling you, this has more depth than you will ever understand. A biblical father, we're going to talk about three traits of a biblical father, and the number one trait that we see here in Ephesians chapter 5 is this. A biblical father submits to Christ above all else. A biblical father says, Jesus is not just my Savior, he's my Lord. And he determines everything that I do. 
He determines how I leave my family. He determines how I treat my wife. He determines how I raise my kids. He determines the the social media I consume. He determines everything that I am, everything that I have, and everything that I do. A biblical father submits to Christ above all else. Dads, it is your job as the spiritual head of the home to lead in this. Going back to Genesis chapter 2 and 3. When Eve sins, Adam is right there with her. While she sinned by commission, he sinned by omission. He sinned by doing nothing. Can I tell you how frustrating it is for wives who have husbands that are doing nothing spiritually? Can I speak on behalf of the wives that are dragging their families to church? Can I speak on behalf of the wives who cry on Sunday morning as they pray for their husbands to know Jesus because they just want a husband that submits to Christ before anything else? Dads, your number one job is to follow Jesus to fall in love with Jesus, to be convicted by the word and the way of Jesus. There's not a single female in this room, I'd be willing to bet, that doesn't want a husband that is doing this first. He submits to Christ above all else. I, I think it's really unique as you read through this passage. Have you, I, when you get a chance this week, read through it with the lens of a guy. Like, okay, so it says, let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. How many men do we know that struggle with those things in a deep way? Such sins have no place among God's people. How about this? Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes. These are not for you. The boys hanging out in the garage, drinking beers, telling dirty jokes. I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm just saying, like, I... I, This is what I see. This is what I feel like the Holy Spirit's like speaking to, right? And don't be fooled by those who try to excuse their sins, for the anger of God will fall on those who disobey. How many times do we make excuses for men? Well, that's just the way guys are. Well, men, they're just visual, and so they look at that stuff that they know they're not supposed to be looking at. It's fine. Well, it, you know, it's just we've lowered the expectation. And, and, then, and then you go to like verse, you go to verse 17. Okay, verse 17. And it says, don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs among yourselves. And making music to the Lord in your hearts. Can I tell you, in the North American church, the hardest person to get to sing is the guy. So we're seeing two things. We're seeing the things that men are not supposed to be doing, we tend to fall into in Ephesians chapter 5, and the things that God's calling us to do, we as men struggle to do in Ephesians chapter 5. The hardest person to get to sing in church is a man. Every time. I just don't think that's a coincidence. Now, now here's, here's where the lie is, okay? Here's, here's where the lie is, because I don't want to devalue moms, okay? Um, you may have seen this statistic before, and, and while it may have some serious merit, it's actually not a founded statistic. Maybe you grew up in church, and you heard this statistic before, okay? This is a statistic that says, when dad comes to follow Christ, when dad comes to know Christ, 93, there's a 93% chance that the family will, will come to know Christ thereafter, okay? Has anybody heard this statistic before? Raise your hand. But however, if if the wife comes to follow Christ or the mom comes to follow Christ, there's only a 17% chance that the rest of the family will know Jesus. And and lastly, when kids come to know Christ first, 3.5% of families will come to follow thereafter. And, And a lot of times what will happen in the past when pastors spout off these statistics, they will use this to describe the vital importance of a father, which I don't want to take that away, okay? But here's the thing. As I did my own research, as I tried to figure some things out and tried to, to, to dig into the importance of what a father is, we actually come to find that this statistic isn't actually founded. 
There is no research company or database or, or study or Barna group that actually did the, the, the intended research to figure out this statistic. It cannot be found anywhere. Some people think it came originally from Promise Keepers, which is an old men's ministry, um, evangelistic ministry that came about. But it, it's actually come, we've actually come to find that, that, that this statistic isn't necessarily true. However, however, other research has been done that shows that the, the husband or the father still has a massive impact. Listen to what this says in an article that I found. It says that uh, that's not to say that fathers have little influence. Indeed, Vern, I'm not going to say his last name because I'm going to say it wrong, Vern Bankston's research on faith and family showed that fathers who have a close relationship with their children, in other words, fathers who are engaged and present and walking alongside their children, are more likely to be to, likely uh, dis, than distant dads to see their kids carry on their family's religious practices, with a father's warmth being more influential than the mother's handing down of the faith. Can I tell you where I see this most often? I see this on Sunday mornings. I cannot tell you how many moms I see in church by themselves dragging their kids to church with their husbands present, versus the number of dads I see coming to church by themselves with just their kids and their wife not in tow with them. Men, you have a, an influence. I can't affirm that first statistic, but I can tell you that I have seen visually and physically and regularly in my nine years of ministry here in Charles City that when you come to church, when you lead your family to the sanctuary, there's a great chance they're going to follow you. A better chance than if your wife drags you there. And a better chance of even if your kids take you there. The, the, the quote goes on. Similarly, Robert Wuthnow, I think is how it said, noted that when fathers are absent or emotionally distant, a wrathful, distant view of God emerged, sometimes closely resembling that of the absent father. And the Swiss study noted above did demonstrate a stronger relationship between a father's church attendance and the church attendance of an adult children compared to the influence of the mother's church attendance. Translation, fathers, you are vital. And the number one thing that you can do for your family that would benefit them greatly is to humble yourself to Jesus Christ each and every day. To say, I'm not going to live for me, I'm going to live for him who is the example of the greatest father we could ever have, and I'm going to do everything I can to be the greatest father I've been created to be. Do you hear what I'm saying? The biblical father submits to Christ above all else. And ladies, if you're looking for a man, if you're single right now and ready to mingle, all right, this is the only thing that matters. When my friends tell me, like, like these, we, have, we have people in church, or, or even my daughter, I've talked to her, I'm like, I'm like, I don't care who you date as long as he loves Jesus. That's all I care about. And, and if you don't know if he loves Jesus or not, can I just be real blunt with you? If you don't know, then he probably don't. Right? Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So, if he loves Jesus, he's probably talked to, him, to, to you about him already. He submits to Christ above all else. Number one, okay? Super simple. Okay, now this is where it might continue to feel simple, but it is so vitally important, and this is where we get it wrong so often when we look for biblical dads. So number one, he submits to Christ above, Christ above all else, but number two, he sacrificially loves his wife. He sacrificially loves his wife. Let's keep reading. Verse 23, or 20, 21, excuse me. And further... Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, Paul says. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is head of the church. He is the Savior of his body, the church. As Christ submits to, excuse me, as the church submits to Christ, so wives, you should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it just as Christ uh, cares for the church, and we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother 
and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, and it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Guys, the best thing you can do for your families as a father, you're like, wait a minute, I'm not the father of my wife. No, but as a father, in the way that you love your wife, you will be an example to your children. I was, I was in Walmart yesterday, and I saw a guy wearing a shirt that I, said, that I thought had some deep and profound meaning to it. It said, a father is a son's first hero and a daughter's first love. I thought that was so good. A son is a father's, excuse me, a father is a son's first hero and a daughter's first love. Why? Because the way that you live your life, your son's most not naturally going to look up to because you're most like him and he's most like you. And not only that, he's going to watch the way that you love your wife and that's going to end up how he be, being how he treats his wife someday. And secondly, Man, the way your daughter sees you love your wife is the way that she's going to expect the guy to treat her when she gets older. If that's not vital, I don't know what it is. Because I want my baby girls, I want my baby girls treated like queens. You hear me? Like perfect, amazing angels. So I better pay attention to how I love and care for and cherish my wife in front of them. Biblical fathers sacrificially love their wives. I think the stereotype when we look at a passage like this, especially for men, is, well, you know, sac- give yourselves up for your wife as you know, Christ did the church. Well, I'd die for my family. I'd jump in a full- burnt front of a bullet for my wife. I'd-, I'd give up my life. Yeah, but would you give up your hobbies? Would you give up your stuff? Would you give up your nights with the boys? I'm being serious. Are are, are you willing to give up your pride? Are you willing to sacrifice that piece? Are are, are you willing to give up your, your former way of living as a bachelor so that you can actually live as one flesh? That's sacrifice. When you lay down your life daily, not just one day. You hear what I'm saying? The biblical father sacrificially loves his wife, and he, and he is Christ to his wife. I love how Paul puts it. He says, he, says <clears throat> he gave his life up for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. Be as Christ loved the church. He did not present her to himself as a glorious, excuse me, he did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands have to love their wives as they love their own bodies. In other words, we are to be Christ to our wives, and we're to lead our wives to Christ. She should not be dragging you to the worship center. You should be leading her to it. One blogger put it this way. Husbands, keep dating your wife. Keep courting her. Keep building her up. Keep pursuing her. Keep making her feel special. Keep choosing her above friends, family, and especially your kids. Choose her above your kids. I'd do anything for my kids. How about your wife? Keep honoring her, respecting her, and cherishing her above all others. Keep admiring her and telling her, all, you're altogether beautiful, my darling. There is no flaw in you like it says in Song of Solomon 4.7. Be jealous for her. You chose her out of the billions of women in the world. Therefore, keep loving her like you did the day before you married her. Keep forsaking her, excuse me, keep forsaking all others and keep reserving yourself only for her. Enjoy your life with your beloved wife during all the days of your fleeting life that God has given you on the earth during all your fleeting days, as it says in Ecclesiastes. For that is your reward in life and in your burdensome work on earth. A biblical father does everything he possibly can to example true love to his children by exampling true love to his wife. Do you hear me? Last one. A biblical father trains up his children. Go into chapter 6 there. It says, children, obey your parents. Amen? All right, let me just read that again. Children, obey your parents. 
Can we just read that together? Children, obey your parents. All right, I'm sorry, I'm done. All right. Because you belong to the Lord. <clears throat> For this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. This is what I love. Honor, if you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you. I love that statement. That sounds like a threat, right? Like, if you want things to go well for you, you better honor your mother and father, right? Like, and you will have a long life on earth. In other words, I brought you in this world, I'll take you out. Okay, that's where the parents get that, guys. Okay, verse four. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline Everybody say discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Can I tell you one of the hardest parts about being a parent is discipline? And let me say why. Because disciplines work. Men, we think we're doing, the, we're doing the work of the family by just going to work and bringing home a paycheck. Can I tell you where the real work is? The real work is in loving your wife well, and the real work is in disciplining your children. We're kind of at a stage in parenting right now in our household where it just feels like discipline is a constant thing. I feel like we're somewhat pulling out of it, but it's probably not going to happen, okay? Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't touch that. Now you're grounded. Now you don't talk to your mom like that. Don't talk to your dad like that. Hey, who ate this? Where'd you steal this from? <laughs> don't put that in your mouth, right? Like, why are you chewing on that? That's our remote. It costs $80, right? Like, it's discipline, 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 discipline. I think the reason we have such an undisciplined generation is because we have a bunch of lazy parents who don't know how to do the work of discipline. Because discipline's hard work. Canceling that movie night that you had planned is hard work. Giving everything up because you had to go home and discipline your child is, is work. Holding fast to that threat that you like regretted putting out, right? Like, great, now we're going to have to follow through. Have you, has your spouse ever said that to you today? Like, or before, right? Like, I can't believe you, you threatened them with that. Now we have to do it if they do it again, right? <laughs> Training up children is hard work. Discipline is hard work. And, and, and I was actually on, at a website called PursueGod.org, and, and, and it talked about the three pillars of biblical parenting within fatherhood. And, and, and all fathers are called to provide, protect, and empower their children. Provide, protect, and empower their children, okay? And, and, and these are the, kind of the three pillars of what it means to take care of our families, especially our children. And, and, and I, I believe in that first one so much that I almost made it a fourth point, right? A biblical father works hard inside and outside of the home. But the reality is, by working hard inside and outside of the home, you are training up your child in the way they should go, amen? And so providing for our children, well, how should we provide for our children? We should provide for them, according to the study, we should provide for them financially, emotionally, and spiritually. The easy part's the paycheck. Financially. Now, some of you might be stay-at-home dads. Maybe your mom, your, your, excuse me, your wife is the breadwinner. Hopefully it's not your mom that's the breadwinner. Anyway, that's okay, you're still providing them for, for them financially by supporting your wife in order that your home may flourish. Provide for them financially, provide for them emotionally. Are you present as a dad? Do your kids feel safe talking to you in the toughest moments? Or are they scared of you? Are you emotionally present for them? And lastly, are you spiritually providing for them? Are you leading them to the sanctuary? Are you getting into the word yourself? Again, going back to Ephesians chapter 5, in the very first half, it's like you get tired of the part where, you know, like especially guys, they read all that, and it feels like, the, like Paul, if you look that through the lens of a guy, you're like, man, Paul, you're coming at me, bro, right, as a dad. I, I don't think it's a coincidence that a lot of guys don't like to read, especially if you're a rural blue-collar boy. Reading is not our thing. We have to push ourselves to do it. I think the enemy likes it that way. Because it keeps us out of our Bibles. And when we don't have the Word of God in us, it's hard to get the Word of God out of us to our children. Amen? We've got to provide. We've got to protect. We've got to protect them from dangerous adults, dangerous friends, and dangerous ideas. Can I say that again for my note takers? We've got to protect them from dangerous adults, dangerous friends, and dangerous ideas, which the world is full of. And I'm not just, when I talk about dangerous adults, I'm not just talking about the white, guy, the white van with the candy bar. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. Even though we've got to stay away from that. Right? 
We obviously want to protect our kids from that. But there are plenty of influences in this world and adults in this world that can negatively impact our kids. Amen? How about the adults that are on our screens? How about the adults that we hang out with that maybe talk ways and do coarse jokes and do things like that that, man, we, our kids probably shouldn't be hearing? Dangerous friends. Dads, are you monitoring who your kids hang out with? Can I tell you how many conversations I've had to have with my kids where I'm like, yeah, I know you want to go over to their house, but they, they don't have the same rules that we do and we don't trust them. I love you, but we just, we're not crazy about that. Or, hey, that friend for you is a bad example and there's no way I will allow you to hang out with them on a regular basis. You might be able to at school because I can't take you away there, but you're not hanging out with them here. There's all kinds of friends that can be bad influences. And then lastly, we got, we, we've got we to protect them from dangerous ideas. And there's a lot of dangerous ideas in the world, even ones that sound Christian that aren't. And we've got to watch out for those things. Lastly, though, we've got to empower them. Um, and, and this is what you may not know. Statistically, when the dad is in the home, the child is more likely to understand the importance of risk-taking and independence in life. When the dad is in the home, your child has more potential to take responsibility for themselves and their own lives than if you weren't in the home. This is why I believe there are a lot of moms, and I'm not attacking you if you're a single mother, okay? But there are a lot of moms in this world that have their kids still living in the home with them because they didn't have dad to kick them out. Right? While mom's got the love gloves, dad's got the boot. Amen? Like, come on. I'll preach to a library. I don't know what it is, right? Amen, guys? Like, we got the boot. I already told Nick, I'm getting it ready, man. He's 13. I'm warming it up. I'm polishing it. Like, you're going to be out, boy. It's our job to empower our kids. To teach them what it means to take responsibility for their lives and to take risks. We have to empower our kids. As a matter of fact, uh, they showed a chart from the that talks about the fundamental law of parenting. And the fundamental law of parenting is this. Healthy parents transfer ownership of their kids' lives from parent to child through the ongoing process of maturity. Okay? In other words, when your kid is first born, all they can do is eat, sleep, and poop. Right? Like, that's about it. So they're not going to be very independent here. But once they start growing up, and when they get to about the 12 to 13 to 14 year old range, like that independence shoots up, right? It's not just that can they dress themselves, now they're getting up to their own alarms, right? Like, it's crazy. My wife and I are just beginning to land in the stage, and we're doing everything we can to teach our oldest son and our oldest daughter, man, you gotta start taking responsibility for your life. You gotta keep a calendar, you gotta keep a schedule, you gotta be on time for things. If you don't show up, we're not gonna punish you, the natural consequences are gonna follow you. Right? It is our job as fathers to empower our kids into adulthood, okay? To protect, to provide, and to empower. A biblical father. I'm going to ask Chris to come up as I wrap up here. I'm just going to ask Chris to come forward. Um, a biblical father submits to Christ above all else. And he sacrificially gives himself up for his wife on a daily basis. And lastly, he trains up his children. The biblical father is vital, is vital to the flourishing of our homes and to the flourishing of our society. And today, as, as we close, I just want to challenge us with a couple questions. If you're a dad, I want you to ask yourself, where do I need to step up as a father? Where do I need to step up as a father? And, and I'm going to say something that, I, that God convicted me of this week in my house, and as I've, as, even as I'm sitting here preaching. And I'm going to confess it to all of you so that I can have some accountability, okay? I need to do a better job at getting in the Word with my kids on a regular basis. With them. I get in the Word by myself quite a bit, but getting into the Word with my children is not something I do often enough. Where do you need to step up as a dad? Do you need to start submitting your life to Christ today? Is today the first day that you're like, you know what, you're right, I need to get right with God. Like, if you're here today and you're feeling a little like, man, I don't even know about this Jesus thing, and Rob's telling me I'm supposed to submit to Christ and love my wife, and I'm telling you, I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to say, hey, man, take the first step. Start by submitting your life to Christ, and the rest will eventually fall in place, I promise you. Let him humble you. Let him break you down. You're not as great as you think you are. The good news is your Heavenly Father is as greater than you think he is. 
and he can help walk you through this. But maybe you're here today and you would say, you know what, I don't have a dad or a father present or my husband. I, I don't come, he's not here in church with me and I hate it. How can you begin praying for that father or husband? What do you need to do to start encouraging them and empowering them and, and trusting them to lead the home well? You, God has a better plan for you than to have an ap- father, fatherless life, okay? When, when, when the father steps up, the family flourishes. Let, let me give you one last statistic as we close. Some studies show that when societies have fathers that are present, invested, and leading in their families well, not only does the home flourish, but entire societies flourish. Did you know that? Whereas when men do not, when they're absent, apathetic, and disengaged, entire social constructs constructs then crumble. As a matter of fact, some research has been done where it shows that just about every time an empire falls... Right before the empire falls, the dad goes too. Translation. We need to do a better job at loving, supporting, encouraging, raising up, training, and praying for good fathers in our church. Amen? Amen. We've got to do a better job at loving and supporting and raising up and training and encouraging and praying for good fathers in our neighborhoods and in our city. We need to pray for good fathers across our nation and our globe. We need to pray for some good dads to step up. And this morning, guys, I want to start with us. So if you're a dad this morning, would you do me a favor? Would you please stand in this moment? Stand to this time so we can pray with you and pray for you. And I know you're a dad, and I know you hate it. You don't like the attention. You don't want to do this. But man, God... It's so important that we pray for you fathers because you are spiritual leaders in your home and you're spiritual leaders in this church whether you think it or not. And so if you're near a dad, would you do me a favor? Reach a hand near him, lay your hand on his shoulder, especially if you're, you're the spouse. Um, man, please grab their hand, do something you can. And let's just pray for our dads. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for being a heavenly father that's present in our lives. And Lord, this morning as we lift up our fathers to you, Lord, we pray that you would help them to be healthy and awesome presence, uh, be a healthy and awesome presence in our homes. And God, that they would be active in our church. And God, that they would be active in our community, that they would set the example, that they would have an Elijah kind of spirit that when things are going wrong, they would step out and call it out in, in a humble and gentle way like you've called us to, Father. God, may the dads in, the, in our church be raised up in confidence and strength and in boldness. May they be used to lead their homes well and may they impact our society with positivity and light, like it says in Ephesians, Lord. Rather than jadedness and anger, like it seems like so many dads fall into so easily, Lord. May we lead with worship and praise and love and adoration for our King. May our, li- may our wives sense that love as we pour it out to them, Lord. And may our children and our generations thereafter and legacies be changed because of your work in us as men. Father, we love you and we thank you and we praise you. And we are here standing to answer the call of your son Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. And all God's people said... Amen. Can we give God some praise for our dads this morning?